of our anti-racism series. Oh, I see that we are being recorded now. It's truly my honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, um, Dr. Jelade Kalinowski. She joins us from uh, the University of Connecticut, where she is an assistant professor of human development and family sciences. Her primary research um, interests pertain to the role of stress and cardiovascular risk reduction in minority populations with a particular focus on Black women who are disproportionately burdened by cardiovascular disease disparities. Her research aims to advance understanding of the complex interactions between psychosocial, behavioral, and community level, level factors contributing to cardiovascular disease disparities in Black women and to develop, test, and implement innovative interventions to mitigate the adverse health effects of stress among Black women. Dr. Kalinowski is the principal investigator and co-investigator on several grants testing novel mind-body stress management interventions among Black women with hypertension. She completed a T32 postdoctoral fellowship in behavioral cardiovascular medicine at New York University, and she is a proud alumna of Teachers College at Columbia University. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Jelade Kalinowski as she talks to us today about stress interventions as an act of resistance in Black women's health. Thank you for such a warm introduction, Dr. Taylor. I am very much looking forward to getting started um, on this talk. Um, I'll shortly be sharing my screen with you all. Um, so um, as Dr. Taylor mentioned, I will be discussing stress interventions as an act of resistance, um, discussing that in the context of Black women's health. I am looking forward to a dynamic conversation. I do ask that we pause questions until the end, um, and I'm sure that we'll have a very robust um, and exciting conversation at that time. So just a little bit of an overview. Um, I plan to give a brief introduction about who I am, um, my research interests in relevant projects, future directions, um, and hopefully a Q&A session at the end. So I do give this introduction because I took a very scenic, circuitous route to health research. And I know that there are students um, on the call today, and this just kind of hopefully normalizes um, you know, taking the scenic route to finding your life's work. So I started off with an interest in politics and um, graduated with a degree in politics and economics from Columbia, and then um, really wanted to be actually a diplomat. And so I went to Georgetown and I studied international relations. And there um, I interned at the Children's Defense Fund um, under Marion Wright Edelman and started really getting interested in health um, stuff. And so I um, ultimately shifted gears, um, and that was um, the impetus for me coming to Teachers College. Um, and then I, uh, following that graduation, I went to NYU and did a postdoc um, and ultimately came here to UConn, where I currently am. So my research agenda is to advanced understanding of the complex interactions between psychosocial, behavioral, and community level factors that contribute to CBD disparities in Black women. I also aim to develop, test, and implement innovative, scalable interventions to mitigate the adverse health effects of stress among Black women. So, um, very broadly, I'm interested in the role of chronic stress and CVD outcomes. I'm interested in psychosocial stressors affecting Black women, and I would like to develop and test stress interventions to prevent and manage CVD. Oftentimes, I'm asked, well, how does stress impact CVD or health overall? And it is a very excellent question, um, and you can see it's very complex, but very in a sense, straightforward as well. So one person may uh, experience chronic stress, discrimination, um, which can lead to this sense of overwhelm and increase of perceived stress, which can lead to a cyclical um, 
manifestation between emotional, behavioral, physiological health effects, which can ultimately lead to incidence of CBD, um, poor quality of life. And in particular, women, um, racial ethnic minorities, older adults, sexual minorities, um, may experience or do experience disproportionate levels of external stress. Why study stress and its effects in women? I've been asked this. And so I like to lead with this because I think it's important to acknowledge why um, I study this particular population. And it's because women report higher levels of perceived stress um, compared to men, for example, and there are gender roles, cultural norms, and historical nuances that also exacerbate um, these issues further, which I will get into um, in this presentation. Also, research shows that psychosocial interventions for post-MI patients have been more effective in men than in women, suggesting that there just needs to be more research and more tailoring to the needs of women. So I'm going to start um, to discuss and talk about the dehumanization and anti-Black woman imagery that really has set the tone historically for a lot of what we see today in terms of health inequities and disparities, particularly in the context of Black women. So um, Patricia Hill Collins is a um, renowned expert in Black feminist theory, and she asserts that longstanding stereotypes have attempted to dehumanize Black women and perpetuate discrimination and continual oppression of Black women. Um, some of this, some just two um, prevailing examples that we see often in media um, and historically are the mammy caricature, which depicts Black women as caregivers, domestic, women, uh, domestic workers who are happy to serve, um, often at the expense of themselves or even their own family. Um, the Black Jezebel, which portrays, you know, a hypersexualization of Black women. Um, that Sarah Bartman, who uh, was a, an enslaved woman in the 18th century, um, who had a curvaceous figure, as some um, depicted it, was exploited at freak shows um, and essentially uh, trafficked um, for sexual human trafficking. Um, these images, these um, attempts to dehumanize Black women um, have longstanding historical implications that continue to manifest in contemporary times. Um, there have been many studies that discuss how um, qu both qualitative and quantitatively uh, um, assess how these images, this imagery um, has shaped um, Black women's body image, um, image of others or how others perceive Black women, um, very extensive um, damage. So um, this, these figures also um, kind of speak to some of the disparities affecting Black women. Um, we see that um, hypertension is highest among non-Hispanic Blacks compared to all other racial and ethnic groups. Um, African-American women bear a disproportionate amount of hypertension um, compared to um, whites and other ethnic groups. Um, and really the the issue is urgent um and i've often been asked well why black women why why study this and this is why um a couple of years ago um dr taylor um another colleague of mine dr swirl and i wrote a piece um in circulation um just discussing this notion of a double jeopardy um, of race and gender related stress that's particularly salient to black women. Um, across both genders, blacks report uh, greater exposure to stressful events and circumstances. Um, black women often experience a toxic combination of gender and race related stress um, and gender and racially motivated minor daily hassles such as microaggressions represent a unique form of chronic stress that may contribute to racial disparities and CBD outcomes 
that we see. Um, and for example, Black women report more frequent gender racial uh, microaggressions, um, who report more frequent gendered racial microaggressions were found to report poor health and quality of life. Um, the superwoman schema really helps to uh, contextualize what um, I had long sort of thought um, about Black women and disengaged coping. Um, it's a conceptual framework developed by Cheryl Woods Giscombe and is incredibly um, genius and profound. And it describes a pattern of cognitive, affective, and behavioral characteristics that help us understand stress and coping and their effects on Black women. So oftentimes there may be a pressure to an to appear strong, suppress our emotions, resist vulnerability and help seeking and prioritizing caregiving for others over caregiving for ourselves. And if you refer back to the previous slide of the Mammy caricature, that was very real for many black women was to put it all aside, get it done many times at the expense of ourselves without even realizing it. So part of my work is to really decolonize health research um, and create a new meaning for Black women's health. Um, and part of that um, is really leaning into a lot of um, people who are doing profound, amazing work. Um, Trisha Hersey is a um, woman, a Black woman who is on a crusade to declare that rest is a form of resistance for Black women. And that is revolutionary um, because that is something that hasn't really been afforded to us in a way um, that Trisha is declaring it should be. There's also what has commonly um, been referred to, um, particularly recently, as the soft life. You know, like just letting go of all these unnecessary high expectations and leaning into being taken care of, leaning into engaging in self-care and taking care of yourself. So this leads um, into my research, which takes a lot of these principles into account. Um, and I'm happy to get into that. So one of the studies that I wanna talk about is stress management for black women with high blood pressure, evaluating effects and mindfulness training on CBD risk. This is a pilot study that I am leading. Um, and it builds on a, an AHA funded collaborative project with UCSD that was for prehypertensive women. Um, and it really leans into a different population, but also acknowledges that um, mindfulness traditionally um, it has been um, conducted in person, um, traditionally with a high burden, and apps, smartphone apps such as Headspace may help to alleviate some of those burdens. The impetus of this research um, was really conducting focus groups um, with Black women that suggested to me that some of the um, burdens and um, reasons why traditional mindfulness may not work um, are because they may want privacy or they may be very busy and they may want to have a self-directed program. Um, and some of these quotes kind of speak to that. Um, phone is good in a lot of ways, better than face-to-face. -face. Black women, when you dig down, dealing with a lot, but you don't talk about it. On the phone, nobody sees you. Phone gives you protection, easier to open up. And that really speaks to that directly. So given um, what you know, I was hearing in these focus groups and the emerging evidence with um, of meditation-based interventions, I decided to look to look further. Um, we know meditation is a promising non-pharmacological approach to reducing BP and CBD risk. And we also know that it's been shown to um, improve emotion regulation, reduce stress, and improve physical and mental health outcomes. Um, 
And some preliminary data has demonstrated that it may be acceptable and feasible in older African Americans with hypertension. Um, but in general, the data is pretty sparse. Um, and so I wanted to contribute to this um, with a feasibility study to look at whether or not we could use smartphone apps, app-delivered mindfulness training, um, otherwise known as AMT, to deliver mindfulness using audio guided meditations that are brief, e easy to understand and engaging. Previous research has shown um, utility and acceptability and feasible of smartphone apps. Um, and given the high usage of mobile use um, in Black women, this seemed like a potentially very um, successful way to engage Black women in meditation. So my aims um, were to compare the feasibility and acceptability of um, MBCT, which is a phone um, program, and AMT in Black women, um, and also to compare the effects of these two programs against usual care um, and on blood pressure and stress in Black women with elevated blood pressure. So the study arms are a telephone um, program, a mobile app program, and a usual care, which usual care is essentially maybe receiving an educational brochure from the AHA, um, and then will be offered um, a two-month app membership at the end of the study. So um, here are some of the measures that I am using. Um, blood pressure, now using home monitoring machines, um, anthropometrics, um, <clears throat> and some EHR review, and some self-reported questionnaires. Okay. I also want to delve into another um, pilot study that I've just wrapped up looking at Black women's stress and COVID-19. Um, this is a paper, one paper that resulted from that study, um, shouldering the load yet again, Black women's experiences of stress during COVID-19. Um, this study was especially salient to me as a Black woman also struggling with navigating COVID-19, caregiving responsibilities, work responsibilities. And overall, it, the, the data was extremely clear and abundant, and it showed that Black women were shouldering so much, yet just didn't necessarily have channels or access to channels to, met, to managing the stress. Here are some um, particularly standout quotes that I decided to include in this presentation. Um, you know, I think between both of those quotes, we see, I couldn't live the life I was adjusted to. I had to look out for my family. I had to help them because they didn't have anyone but me. My mother only had me. My grandparents only had me. And then uh, if you look, at the second quote, um, you know, you see someone struggling to, with their finances, struggling to take care of their mother who has HIV, um, chronic illness, um, losing hours at work, um, and then the manifestation of all of these things on her mental health. Now, another um, study that is very close and dear to my heart, largely because every time I think of the Intergen study, um, which is led by Dr. Taylor um, and Cindy Cresto, I remember uh, meeting Dr. Taylor for lunch for the very first time, eight months pregnant with twins in July, <laughs> um, and her willingness to really um, engage me in the study and allow me to um, learn so very much. So um, I'm going to discuss um, a paper that resulted from the Intergen study, um, which is police discrimination and depressive symptoms in African-American women. Um, and this paper was incredibly important to me um, because it really tells a story that is not 
told to the extent that it should be in empirical data and literature. Um, now, especially since um, the summer of 2020, there's definitely been a push to um, dealt to have more empirical data on police discrimination and um, police discrimination incidents, how it manifests in physical and mental health. But, you know, the data is still sparse. Um, and that's incredibly problematic because even just preliminary studies such as um, our mm -hmm. own show that depression is is linked to police discrimination. Um, and in the particular context of intergen, which is um, pre predominantly young or young black women um, who are mothers, there is a unique um, angle of suffering police discrimination yourself and then worrying about your child, worrying about your child's experience um, in the world and whether they are safe or not. I am also going to um, talk about the Jackson Heart Study Hypertension Working Group, which has um, I've been a part of since my postdoc years at NYU and has been instrumental um, in my growth and development as a researcher. Um, the Jackson Heart Study is an NHLBI funded prospective cohort study of African Americans in the Jackson, Mississippi, um, metropolitan area. It was designed to investigate causes of CVD in African Americans, and there have been four study visits completed since 2000. So an incredibly rich body of longitudinal data. Um, it entails um, a multidisciplinary team of investigators, all looking at novel behavioral and psychosocial um, community level predictors of hypertension and CVD outcomes. Mentoring is a major focus. Um, I'm an ESI early stage investigator um, on this um, in this group. So um, some of the work that has resulted from um, this group is um, a demonstration that chronic stress increases risk of hypertension in Blacks. Um, we saw that high chronic stress is associated with a higher risk of developing hypertension in all covariate adjusted models. Um, other GHS projects that I'm involved in um, include a um, manuscript that is looking at concurrent high stress and or high concurrent stress and depression on incident CBD in African Americans. And I've also co-authored several other publications looking at prediabetes and CBD risk, um, hypertension treatment recommendations, um, awareness with hypertension and distress, otherwise known as labeling, um, and then also stress, depression, and engagement in life simple seven, which is AHA's American Heart Association's lifestyle recommendation for ideal cardiovascular health. Now I'm going to um, discuss another project uh, that I've been involved in that um, Dr. Tanya Spurl is the PI of, and that is a telephone-based stress management per for women with myocardial infarction. This is based out of NYU's heart attack research program, otherwise known as HARP, um, and it is a very comprehensive way of looking at um, sex differences in cardiovascular disease disparities, and it has three major components, a clinical aspect, um, which um, has multi-modality imaging in women um, with Minoka to determine etiology. Um, there's a basic science component, which is assessment of platelet biology in women with um, heart attacks. And then the population study, which was more um, where I was involved, which is to which was in RCT to test effects of stress management in women post MI. Um, so the idea was to investigate these causes and uh, outcomes of heart attacks in women. Um, we know that there are many differences in um, between sexes, um, also racial and ethnic um, disparities. So um, this 
study looked at MBCT, which is a phone-based program um, to assess whether or not MBCT and provided in the context of a group um, could improve mindfulness and cognitive skills, reduce rumination. The MBCT -T program was an eight hour or eight week, one hour um, group with groups between five to seven women. And then it was compared against the heart disease education program, which is also eight weeks, but 15 minute calls with a trained nursing student and on an individual basis. Um, I'm going to discuss some of the findings that are particularly salient to Black women in the context of Black women's health. There is a plethora of data from this study um, that just concluded, and many um, of the results are um, actually in publication or um, in preparation. Um, but in the context of Black women, we saw that um, baseline sleep characteristics um, were shorter um, compared to um, the other racial and ethnic groups. Um, we also saw that Black women had poor, poor sleep quality compared to other racial and ethnic groups. Um, and so like, for example, 42 more minutes of wakefulness after sleep onset per night. And we also saw that high stress and depressive symptoms were associated with shorter sleep duration and poor sleep quality. And if you refer back to one of my, if you think back to one of my earlier slides, um, sleep as a um, physical manifestation of how stress may impact health, this is um, exemplary of that. So um, some future directions and um, ways that I hope to continue this work um, on stress management and Black women um, is collaborating on extramural funded projects. Um, and so most recently, I'm collaborating on a recently funded R01 application entitled um, Telephone-Based Mindfulness Training to Reduce Blood Pressure in Black Women with Hypertension in the Jackson Heart Study. Um, this was recently funded, which I'm very excited about. Um, you know, female JHS participants had a mean age of 62.6 um, at exam three, um, and now approximately 73 years of age. So this will be looking at um, older women and the and how this um, may be helpful to older Black women with hypertension. Um, there is also um, wrapping up the heart trial, um, which I just um, discussed in my presentation. Um, and then um, looking at many of different kinds of mod modifications to traditional MBCT um, to um, include remote delivery, abbreviated sessions, um, less home practice, more home practice, just tailoring um, these programs to best meet the populations that we're intending to serve. Some other current and future directions that I am um, hoping to um, engage in is to build on my current work relating to um, what other stress management approaches are acceptable and feasible among Black women. Um, can stress management improve adoption of healthy lifestyle behaviors to reduce CBD risk in Black women? Um, and another question that I have is, for example, can the superwoman schema help identify Black women who may benefit more um, from stress management interventions? Um, and then especially important and salient to my heart is building the pipeline of underrepresented minority investigators who are committed to health equity research and this research. Um, and that includes mentoring, advocacy, and community engagement. Um, Dr. Taylor has a very um, important grant that is um, looking at mentoring and um, increasing the pipeline of researchers um, in health research. And um, it's very clear that 
to do this work, to continue this work, to really make the changes that we want to see, to actively resist um, the structures that be, that perpetuate these disparities, we'll need to increase the number of people um, who are able to look at these um, disparities. And so I am um, very much committed to those efforts and um, it very much informs uh, my teaching at UConn, uh, my participation in the summer program um, that Dr. Ch Taylor hosts, um, and then also just informally with other up and coming researchers, particularly those who are um, URM. I think it's very important to acknowledge um, many people who are who have been incredibly instrumental. Um, so first and foremost, the research participants who share their hearts with me, um, who allow me to tell their stories, um, and the volunteers who help coordinate those efforts, um, the NIH and NHLBI. Um, the American Heart Association, um, Headspace, who has been a um, an excellent industry partner in this work, collaborators and colleagues at NYU, Columbia um, University School of Nursing, Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, um, the Jackson Heart Study, the Jackson Heart Study Hypertension Working Group, and also the Heart Attack Research Program at New York University School of Medicine. So that concludes uh, my slide presentations, and I wanted to leave um, plenty of time for conversations about um, stress as a resistance tool um, to alleviate and address these persistent health disparities. So I thank you all for coming, and I am looking forward to um, now a robust discussion on these topics. Thank you so much, Dr. Kalinowski. Your work is amazing and all of the many things that you do to look at in reducing stress in um, Black women to reduce health disparities um, in this area. We're happy to take any questions from the audience. Please just um, unmute your mic and you can feel free to ask um, questions of Dr. Kalinowski or you may put it in the chat if you like. I, can, I have a lot of questions for you, so I can. Okay. <laughs> I, have have a, any. Uh, I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Collins. My name is Lisa Evans. Um, I was re listening to your slide presentation. It hit so close to heart because I am a Black woman. Um, I currently myself am hypertensive, and I'm learning to manage my stressors to reduce that and in do a change of lifestyle. And I it, it resonated with me because I acknowledged that I have a black mother, I'm married, six children, well, they're grown kids now. And that course of parenting, it is stressful for black women because I have two sons and four girls and you worry about their existence in this world and the culture that we're in. So that added stressor of raising them healthy making sure they get what they need. And like you said, taking care of others and ignoring my self-care. And so your slides and your um, presentation, it just hits close to home. And then I realized that I added, the added stresses that I have, like I'm back at school now. Like I got to the point where, okay, I've gotten them to the point where I made sure they know education is excellence and they go on. And then I realized, I cut short my education because I started a family. And then COVID came and most people were like, why would you wanna go back to school during COVID? So I went back to school, I finished my degree. I got a, I'm a bachelor's in sociology. And then I added more stressors, I guess on myself. I said, well, let me go back for more. And I'm now in a master's in for public health administration. And I thank you for your presentation because it definitely hit close to home. And if possible, I would like to, if any other research outlets you're looking up for, have me as a contact or anything, because I'm definitely interested in the Black woman experience as well as Black women's experience in maternity as well. 
Thank you for sharing. I just put my email in the chat. So you or yeah. anyone who would love to, I would love to follow up with anyone and everyone um, after this presentation yeah. and talk. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, oh, no problem at all. I'll also share that a lot of what, or, well, not a lot, everything <laughs> that really inspired this work had to do with my upbringing and how I grew up. Um, my Both of my parents, were um, immigrants who came to the US and my dad had cancer shortly after coming. Um, both of them did not have any health insurance whatsoever and he passed away. And my mom became a single mom of two children in a new country um, as a black woman and had to really learn what being a black woman is in the United States versus where she came from. So really she and I were learning together as we processed what it really means to be a black woman and um, seeing her manage hypertension and um, that being somewhat normalized really. It's like, oh, everybody, it's like, no, everyone doesn't have or need to have hypertension. So, um, and now she's in her soft life era herself, oh. um, now that we're all grown and out of the house. And so you're um, sharing that. Um, I and appreciate you hearing is that. It, um, did you say, I, I didn't, well, I, I often forget, I, in my, con in my journey in life, during that time period, I did beat stage three breast cancer. So okay. I'm in that course of, like you said, self-care where now I'm focusing, okay, I'm going back to school. And I even tell my children, um, I can't help right now. Mommy is focusing on herself. So I've given you the skills, you know, so, you know, you can make the decisions for yourself now, you know, every once in a while, they still try to le lean on mommy like, okay, well, you used to do it. Well, no, you're grown. You're, most of you are out of the house. I'm trying to get the last <laughs> three out. But other than that, mommy doesn't have time right now. Yeah, so thank you so much and kudos to you and definitely please follow up with me um, afterwards. Thank you. Yeah. I see we have a question, uh, Lewis Brown. Yes, um, I'm a dermatologist practicing 38 years in Philadelphia and I've definitely seen other manifestations, cutaneous and hair related manifestations of stress. But um, the questions I have with you are actually threefold. One would is, um, are, how have you strat or are you planning to stratify your data based on um, educational attainment, uh, uh, economic uh, um, uh, uh, wherewithal, um, uh, marital status and children. Uh, the other issue is what are you using as a control group? And then the third issue is what preventive measures would you recommend? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for those excellent questions. So um, your, in, your question about stratification is actually incredibly important and something that I often struggle with in the current literature um, is that a lot of a lot of studies on um, this was um, came out in a systematic review that I led recently is that a lot of studies just do not stratify by race and gender, um, which makes it a little bit challenging to tease out some of the results to see who they're relevant to and how they pertain to certain populations. Um, and so that's um, something that I look to, um, I'm hoping to address in my, my own research. Um, and regarding, um, you know, educational attainment and other sociodemographic um, variables, I think that that's an incredibly important question because some emerging literature is actually showing that um, Black women who have higher levels of education and um, sort of white collar jobs are actually facing higher perceived workplace discrimination than those who are not, um, which you might think would be reversed, um, but, it, but it makes total sense when you think about it, right? That you're breaking barriers, you're in spaces that weren't designed to accommodate you. And so therefore you're probably maybe experiencing microaggressions, macroaggressions. Um, and so that's something that I'm really interested in um, in future work is actually looking specifically at workplace 
um, workplace stress and workplace discrimination. Um, and so, yes, there are definitely differences there that I hope to explore. Um, and in terms of like other um, confounders, you know, in addition to socio-demographic factors like, you know, health, um, we definitely adjust for those where we can and where the data is available. Um, what I often see is that despite the numerous investment dollars put into health equity research and health disparities research, you'd be flabbergasted by some of the lack of attention to certain inclusion um, of really pertinent confounders or what you might think would be incredibly important to consider. Um, and so often when it is available um, and when we can, we will um, account for those. The Jackson Heart Study um, in particular, because it is so robust and longitudinal, there tends to be um, an incredible um, rich amount of um, just lifestyle and other medical factors that we can consider. Um, Intergen also literally the only um, data source looking at young Black women right now to this, or that has looked at young Black women to the nature that it has, which is also like astonishing to think about. So um, it's a little bit of a long-winded way of addressing your points, but um, that is my life's work. So hopefully in the next few years, I'll have even more of an update for you there. And then I see Dr. Connor, George Connor. Hi, um, excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I have just maybe points of discussion and some questions for you. Um, so I'm this, an assistant dean for the nursing program at Loyola and I really, and, and stress has been something I've been looking at with immigrant populations, you know, since my dissertation. Um, we have a grant that is focusing on um, increasing diversity within our nursing program. And so we're really, this is this one is in particular is supporting um, our black and Latinx students. And um, I started, or there's this program, a seven week cognitive based um, therapy program, but really it, it is trying to develop coping strategies and, and resilience because um, we wanna support these students. I, I, one of, of my things is we need to start early. We need to start them now as they're going to school because nursing school is so stressful. Um, it's not just about retention, but learning these skills. So when they're out practicing, you know, they can, can manage this stress. But I, I found, um, so I did the first seven week session last semester um, on this Cope to, to Thrive. Um, and it's, you know, it's focusing on self-care, it's focusing on those things. But I found, it, so I'd like to know more about your thoughts really about the online because I did this in person. And part of it was I wanted to kind of build that sense of belonging for the students and a connection, because I think that's important. Um, but I found that they, like you were saying, it was hard to have a discussion and even in these small groups. And so I, I would just kind of like to, because there is an online version of this, which I resisted for a long time. Um, but I'm wondering if, that is something actually that would be beneficial um, to do and then still have something, you know, to build in um, some contact with them. That's a really great point. I actually um, recently became affiliated with UConn Center on M Health and social media. And through that endeavor, I've become a lot more um, familiar and interested in M health tools in general. Um, and they, I, I'm meeting a lot of researchers who kind of denounce sort of traditional M health, like, oh, we'll give you an app or we'll give you some like online group. And then magically, like all of the issues that we had with traditional in-person adherence um, and attrition will go away. And that's obviously definitely not 
true at all. <laughs> um, and to address that, there are all sorts of um, strategies and tools that one can use to facilitate engagement, um, ranging for time of day that you post to the kind of interaction that you would post. Like maybe you post a poll, like maybe you post a vote or um, like just different ways, different strategies to engage and get people um, to continue um, and having them see value in what they're doing. Um, obviously once, you know, it's hard enough, like we all see the value of exercise. It doesn't mean that we do it, but we, you know, it definitely helps. I think if there was no value in exercise, I'm sure we'd have even less physical activity. So um, there are just a lot of um, ways to engage that um, I had never really considered in prior work that I'm definitely thinking about in the future, particularly with a lot of these scholars who are looking at mHealth tools um, and who have really systematically identified ways to implement these tools in um, our work. So that would be one kind of, I guess, kind of recommendation um, that I'd be happy to talk with you offline about. And then another piece to that is, you know, as a URM or former, well, current, always a URM, former student, um, I, and now as an assistant professor, um, and we have these talks all the time, like, okay, like we want to be diverse, like everyone just, we, we want diverse people, like that's what we want. And of course that's what we want, but we also have to make sure that the systems in place are also working towards those goals too. And that means everything from the, you know, interactions with professors and faculty all the way down to advising and the health center and these other services. I can't tell you how many people along my journey told me not to go to graduate school or somehow otherwise discouraged me from pursuing my my dreams. And so, um, you know, on one hand, I'm like, oh, I think this is really cool and fascinating. And I think I can make a lot out of this. And then maybe an advisor saying, you know, I don't know if you really have the grades to do that. And there's a disconnect, obviously, between like a program director and that very isolate or that, that experience that a student might be feeling who never even may communicate that. To a program director. So I think also making sure that the systems are actually in place for students to not just come, but to stay and thrive. And that's often why I spend so much of my time mentoring Black women um, in my programs and other underrepresented minorities, even though I know that they tell us that Black faculty are overburdened with this, is because I know what it feels to have to have um, to be in this in these spaces and not um, feel welcomed um, by all. So I think addressing those things um, will probably be very important to you as you are looking to implement this program. Yeah, thank you. And and that's what the grant is kind of is trying to um, support. You know, from all sorts of aspects, including the mentoring, peer leadership, um, but it's you know, we're trying to also address all aspects of it. And it's, it's challenging, but it is like you're saying worth the, you know, worth the, definitely the, worth the effort. And yeah. there are a few of us who are um, faculty of, of color and it does rest on, on us. And I agree with, you know, it's, it's work, but who's going to actually gonna do it? And do when it? it's and done we well, it's, profound. Um, yeah. And even Dr. Taylor can mm -hmm. speak to this, but, you know, I came into a postdoc kind of like, I, I mean, I know I want to do this work, but I don't have dozens of publications like some of these other folks have. I don't have that pedigree. Like I, I just am really excited about this work. And I came into a URM T32 that was in its first year, the inception in the first cohort. And the first day, all they kept talking about was mentorship, mentorship. We got to find new mentors. We got to find new mentors. And I'm like, what is this, <laughs> this obsession with mentors only to come and find out that these mentors would be 
dear and trusted advisors um, on many aspects of my career and even personal. Um, and, you know, one of my um, dearest mentors, Dr. Ogizegbe, is the one who introduced me to Dr. Taylor um, and orchestrated a lunch for me at <laughs> eight months pregnant with twins <laughs> in July, which <laughs> if you're in New York City, you know that that's literally hell. Um, but was one of the most life-changing meetings that I, I will ever have. And that was six months, six years ago. And that, um, you know, was the beginning of my work with Intergen and really just solidifying my place um, in Black women's CBD disparity. So, um, and also Dr. Tanya Spurl, who was incredibly instrumental in my work and development. So um, when done well, it can really, really, um, be incredibly profound. And that mentorship has bared so much fruit in who I mentor and who I hope that my students will mentor. Oh, thank you. And I will be in touch. Um, and but, and I understand please. what you mean about Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I see so, a couple more questions. Um, Amanda Rybeck. Hi, um, my name is Amanda and I'm an ICU nurse actually here in Manhattan. Um, I really took an interest in this lecture and thank you. It's been very informative. And thank you for sharing like so much person personal details about your story, um, especially about, you know, touching on the resilience and mentorship programs. Currently I'm um, kind of looking into graduate school and I've been very discouraged. I come from a single, you know, low income home. Uh, my GPA, unfortunately, during school wasn't the best. I didn't have mentorship, so I live in a small town. Um, and honestly, I was just trying to survive. Um, so I do feel that in terms of resilience for nursing students and mentorship, um, that's something great that I do believe um, students not only need, but it is very difficult to reach out to you know, a lot of students, they might not be open. Um, I might have some ideas that could help um, the previous speaker and getting students to engage in that. But um, anyhow, what I wanted to ask is, um, for your presentation and all your research, is there some kind of way that I could implement teaching into um, my patients to help with hypertension? Um, it is an ongoing issue, especially in the medical ICU the past couple of years. A lot of the black women they do experience pain that we find is you know under treated black women don't get the same type of treatment from doctors they aren't listened to so have you found ways that um, might improve health care uh, also the delivery of education um, to patients in order to help with hypertension i know that meditation self-help and all that is very important but um, i find that it might be very difficult to teach patients especially those that are lower income and then also they're usually in the medical ICU and not have a support system. So uh, they're coming off of sedation from maybe being intubated and uh, having all these healthcare issues. It's, it's difficult to try and teach and make that education stick from a medical ICU yeah. standpoint. Yeah, um, I think that's an excellent question. Um, to your earlier point about your interest pursuing graduate school and maybe not fitting the traditional mold, I say kind of go for it anyway. Um, I'll be totally blunt with you. There were a couple doctoral programs that I got flat out rejected from, not even an interview. And I met with um, a professor at Teachers College and being in politics for a little while, I have really come to value the importance of storytelling and knowing someone's story and humanizing someone and being able to say, okay, like, I'm sorry, I don't have a hundred publications. I'm 23, but like who has a hundred publications at 23? But here's what I've done. Here is what I know I can do. Like, will you even hear my story? If you won't hear my story, we probably don't even have a ton to connect on anyhow. Um, and like, can, are you even willing to, to listen and to, to hear me? And so I found a couple of those programs and somehow along the journey, wherever I am, I am able to sort of find out and seek out those people, like my people, my village, my community, and they always, always come through for me. And um, 
I suggest finding those people where you are trying to identify those people and don't give up where there's, there's a will, there's a way. Um, and just, you know, the other day I was actually thinking about that um, because I was doing my intro slides and thinking about my degrees and my journey and getting rejected and getting rejected, but getting accepted here, getting accepted here. And I'm like, well, you know, part of that is a part of my story. And part of that trajectory is completely normal. Like we're not all like only like, and you'll see in academia, it's like 99 rejections, one acceptance. And usually that one acceptance kind of carries you through just when you're about to like give up <laughs> and lose all hope. Um, and so I'm happy to talk with you more offline about that if you wanna follow up with me and send me an email. Um, and in terms of your other question, I think it's a really important one. And it's partly part of what frustrates me sometimes as a researcher is that there are different levels of oppression and systems that we need to address, right? There's an individual level, there's a sort of more macro institutional level. And obviously we can address, addressing someone's response to stress is seemingly the most attainable way that we can at least address this on an individual behavior, but doesn't address why you have to deal with that in the first place. And that is something that kind of I'm I'm trying to navigate um, honestly in my future in my future work, and I have um, I'm working with some colleagues at UConn who are more policy level folks who are looking at like okay how do we address food deserts, how do we improve policies that will actually affect change so that on an individual level what we're asking you to do is even feasible, you know I. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Waterbury, Connecticut, but um, economically there, there's struggle there. And I um, was driving through Waterbury and I had screaming toddlers in the car who were demanding snacks. And so I looked up a grocery store and I went in thinking, I'm gonna get some clementines, a couple yogurts, a string cheese, could not find any of them in that grocery store in Waterbury. Could not find any of that. Just completely shocked. So I understand we're telling patients, especially with eat healthy, eat more fruits and vegetables, exercise, but you, you don't have healthy foods at your grocery store. You're jogging down the street and you might get hunted down by vigilante. Like there are these system level things that we're not addressing that almost make it kind of offensive to even ask people to take on those roles. So um, it's something I wanna, I wanna navigate and, and deal with. And I um, honestly struggle with it myself. Like, you know, I recently took up um, vintage furniture sort of flipping. <laughs> as a hobby, because I'm like, I need an outlet, I need an outlet. So I go to a furniture mall where that has thousands of reviews, lots of amazing pieces I'm strolling through. And as I stroll through towards the end, I see a big black face doll. And I'm stunned, like was not expecting this. I mean, it is an antique mall, so maybe should I have expected this? I don't know. This happened two weeks ago and I still ruminate over the image I saw. And I think, should I call them and tell them to take it down? Should I go in person? Am I safe to do that? Like all of these different thoughts that have taken up space in my mind. And that's not, of course I can deal with how do I manage my rumination, my rumination, but the issue is why the doll was there in the first place. And so it's complicated, um, but I do think that we need to think a lot more about some of the more system policy implications that we can address to make this more feasible. And we have time for one more question. I'm I'm trying to be mindful Oops, of time yeah. here. And Laura Manzo has waited so patiently. <laughs> We're going to give you a chance to ask your question. 
Thank you. Um, thank you for your talk so much. I am a critical care nurse in the Army, and I'm a first year PhD student at Yale. So I'm right down the road from you, actually, in Connecticut. <laughs> um, and I am interested in building a program of research um, dismantling structural racism towards the achievement of health equity. And as I'm building my dissertation research, I'm specifically looking at how structural racism is contributing to racial and ethnic disparities in service women's maternal and infant outcomes, because we have universal health care. So you would think that would kind of offset some of these disparities, yet we still see them. So we know it's these system level um, influences, these upstream factors. What advice would, do you have for a novice researcher that is looking to investigate at the structural level? Um, because I'm finding it very difficult even finding measurement instruments um, because I don't think a lot of this research has been done as of yet. I think I have two pieces of advice. One is that don't expect the current paradigms to fit what you're trying to do and change because that wouldn't make very much sense, right? Is they're not set up to, to really spark change or something new. So that means that there's an opportunity for you to create it. Um, and more important than that, I would say, is to lean into your community of participants and listen and allow them to tell their stories. I think that allowing them to tell, a lot, listening to the stories of participants might my most important aspect of this work is doing interviews and collecting primary data from participants. Hearing their stories will never be old to me. And in hearing their stories, I'm able to better suit them and listen to how they think I can help them because they are the experts. And I think that that just trickles down to a lot of other fundamental values about respect, um, challenging paradigms that no longer serve us, expecting patients to come to us. Why don't we go to patients? Um, I've been getting into um, New Amsterdam, which is loosely based off of Bellevue. And one of the episodes is based on Dr. Joe Ravenel's um, barbershop um, intervention on hypertension and the big obviously this is a fictional show based off of some true stories but dr um dr goodwin he always says how can i help and in doing that he's leaving the patients leaving the experts up to like to listen to them to lean into them and to to lean into their expertise. And um, I've just found that to be incredibly instrumental in everything that I do. Like I remember their stories. I remember the names of their children. I remember interviewing a woman who had no time whatsoever, had a, a black woman who had a heart attack at 36, had a one-year-old who was literally screaming in the background and said, I have to, I have to do your study and taking the time to lean into her expertise about what she could tell me. Um, and I think in doing that, it has really changed me as a person and how I approach research in general. Okay, thank you for that. I definitely plan to do a qualitative study after my dissertation, the military likes numbers. That's yeah. kind of how it runs. I know, but you can always weave it in there. Yeah, right. So my like plan after I graduate <laughs> is to do a qualitative study because I think these things need to be heard. Um, and I think that then we can finally understand more about what's happening. So then we can intervene because ideally exactly. I would like to intervene. Exactly. And you can definitely follow up with me offline um, in my email if you um, want to find Absolutely. Out. Thank you so much. Well, I want to thank you all for attending our speaker series. And then most uh, most of all, thanking uh, Dr. Jelade Kalinowski for sharing her expertise, her brilliance, the great work that you do is so important and impactful. 
And as you see from the discussion, we could really keep you here all day if we had the time, but we know that you're a very- uh, I would love to be. This is my favorite <laughs> part about academia. So thank you for inviting me. So we truly enjoyed your presentation, as you can see here. And you know, I hope that you know that your work is uh, very valuable and that you continue doing the, this important work that you're doing. And it's been my pleasure to, to work with you. Um, during this during this these past six years and I look forward to even more collaborations in the future. Thank you so very much. I'm so honored to have been a part of this series and I definitely look forward to working with you more Dr. Taylor but also others on the call if you would like to follow up with anything that I mentioned today um, please do email me. Um, my email's in the chat. And I can Thank you everyone. Have a great day.